So I'll share, um, I'll share for about 15 or 20 minutes, and then we'll move into small groups. And I'll mention this again later, but questions are certainly welcome in the chat. I have the chat up, and so I will keep an eye on it. But thank you again for this invitation. So, so here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, just greeting and welcome, which we've done already, move into a bit of scripture. Our hopes is United Methodist, and we'll dig into our creeds and social principles, and then move into some conversations about diversity and building empathy. And then we'll be whisked away into small group discussions, and we'll all come back after our small group discussions. So as a reminder, questions in the chat are a delight. Um, on the one hand, I love being with people in person. On the other hand, this being remote is safer overall. My secondary appointment is Crossroads United Methodist Church um, near the west side of Columbus. We had a couple of COVID outbreaks over Christmas Eve and uh, the Sunday after Christmas. And so we're remote right now. And so I really uh, appreciate taking this remotely. And while I look out the window and I don't see a bunch of snow, we're supposed to get snow. So perhaps it's good that we're not driving around later this afternoon and evening. Um, you'll get this presentation in a handout and you'll also get a discussion guide with our discussion questions and a PDF and a reading list if you want to read more. So, so first of all, I want to say thank you for the invitation. This is really humbling. I am a fan of Linworth and the opportunity to talk about, talk about topics related to diversity and inclusion and social justice are near and dear to my heart. So thank you for your willingness to engage in this process. There are a lot of churches that would never have any interest and actually would have hostility to this kind of conversation. So thank you again. So we'll move into some scriptural grounding for why we are talking about what we're talking about. This is one of my favorite scriptures from Micah 6 verses 6 through 8. Um, it begins with giant big picture and the speaker is saying, what should I come before the Lord with? Should I bow myself before God on high? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves? Should I do all of these things? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? And then the text transitions and says, God has told you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justice and to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God. The scripture reminds us that God doesn't want us to check things off and God doesn't want us to perform our faith. God wants us to act justly, love mercy, and walk humbly. It's also important for us to remember that whenever we, well, it's moving into a mindset rather than going through tasks. And I'm sure that we've seen churches and Christians, and maybe we've had this in a part of our lives where we were how do I want to say this? We may have been performing a surface level faith when God actually wanted us to change our minds and our hearts. And there's also the reminder that when we look at what God wants for us and wants of us, the gospel prioritizes those who are on the margins. The gospel prioritizes those who are not in the middle, who don't have all the power and who have need. The gospel never prioritizes the individual over the whole. Now, this doesn't mean that we disappear ourselves as individuals. We each and every one of us matter to God, but God never elevates one person so that another person can be pressed out. So this means that all people do matter. Everyone is viewed as equal in God's eyes. And when one group is pushed outside of the community or treated unfairly or marginalized, our faith directs us to help them. Um, I'm sure some of you saw the news about the uh, hostage situation, what was that, yesterday afternoon um, after services in a synagogue, and I believe it was Texas. The congregation members there in that synagogue were being marginalized and they were harmed. It would be inappropriate for us to say, well, what about this group and what about this group? God centers those who have been harmed whether in the moment or through system. But then the truth of the matter is that, especially in churches, we have these aspirations of reaching out and helping all of those in need and centering those who are marginalized. 
but sometimes we're not often very good at it. Sometimes our vision of who we want to be as Christians or in a church isn't actually who we are. And it's a tension and it's humbling when we say that we have values and then we look around and we realize, oh gosh, maybe we're not living out those values. Sometimes we fall short of what God asks of us, which is very Wesleyan. We have a God that practices and gives us abundant grace, regardless of whether we've earned it or not, and we have not earned it. And sometimes we fall short in our Christian walk. But the strength of being a part of the United Methodist Church, and I think part of the strength of Linworth is that we are connectional. We are not independent entities and we are methodical people. And so we often build resources to hold ourselves accountable. Um, I'm mentioning the United Methodist Women. There are so many groups within the United Methodist Church over the years and currently who call us out and call us as Christians individually and collectively to be better. And I have to mention that the United Methodist Women have been one of the primary voices throughout the history of the denomination calling out what is broken and relentless in calling out when we do not care for the marginalized. And I mean that in a positive way. They never stop telling us when we are falling short of our Christian duties to love all people. So we, we're not necessarily going to talk deeply about the social principles of the United Methodist Church, um, but the, it's a collection of documents that we have voted on that we have shaped over time and it is what we stand for and who we stand for. How do we engage with the world? How do we think about the environment, about gender, about race, about money, about medicine, about education? And these are principles about who we are and who we want to be. Um, there are study guides for the social principles of the United Methodist Church and I may be I think there's also a United Methodist Women's Guide, like a study guide that will take you through it. So we have lots of resources. We're not going to dig into the social principles right now, but I think it's important for us to name that not all denominations have robust documents that have been voted on and um, were moved toward perfection over time. They're not perfect, but moving toward perfection over time where it is a core belief a value of who we are as a denomination. So our creeds and our beliefs are theological frameworks and theological frameworks are simply how do we think about God, how do we think about humanity, and how are we called to engage with the world. And our faith is what empowers us to look at the world and consider who is pushed to the side. We have a faith in the United Methodist Church, but especially in Christianity, a faith where we have personal relationships with God and Jesus Christ and also our faith is so much more than that one-on-one -on -one relationship with God and Jesus Christ. And as I shared in Micah 6, 8, and throughout the Gospels, our faith empowers us to look at the world and consider who does not have much of a voice, who is being pushed to the side, who are we not noticing? Forward again. So let's talk a bit about diversity. Um, I will share, I... I currently serve as the Director of Diversity and Inclusion in the West Ohio Conference. Um, on March 1st, I'm actually going to go back to Methodist Theological School and serve full time in enrollment and admission, which was an unexpected change. And I'm just delighted because I served there for over 10 years. But I will say that combining the two roles, the way I've figured out how to get people to not talk to me in airports is I tell them the truth. I tell them that I am a clergywoman who works in diversity and then people will never ever talk to me again. It is really convenient because I am actually an introvert, but back to diversity. So diversity is simply the mix of differences that make a difference in an interaction. So you get two people in a room, you have diversity. You get an individual talking to a group or engaging with let's say a church, you have diversity. But you can have two churches um, and you have diversity. I, my kiddo goes to Faith UMC um, in Canal Winchester, their kids, she's five, their kids daycare preschool. Uh, there are two United Methodist churches in Canal Winchester. They're on the same street. You can see one when you're standing outside of one and yet they have not merged. And there's a lot of conversations just about that, but there's a lot of diversity in those two little churches that are less than a block away from each other. So diversity is the mix of differences that makes a difference in an interaction. 
In other words, you don't have to be stressed when you hear the word diversity. It's simply any difference that makes a difference. I also really like this picture, so I'm glad I was able to use it today. But. So when we talk about diversity, we can talk about dimensions of diversity. We're not going to talk about all of these today, but these topics may show up um, throughout the year as you continue this series. <clears throat> And this list is not comprehensive. There are lots of different dimensions of diversity. You have race and you have ethnicity or gender and sexuality, geography, where you live, um, where people may say, I live in Columbus, Ohio, or they may get real, real specific. That's a form of diversity as well. Sheltering is a word that I recently learned. It's how you live, whether you're renting or buying by choice or by circumstance, whether you are homeless or unhoused by choice or by circumstance. Um, whether you choose to move every couple of years and you want to live across the nation or whether you're forced to move every couple of months or couple of years, that's a form of diversity. And then you've got socioeconomic status and ability and disability, political views and theology and ethics. Um, and then I do mention, um, I'll be curious to hear if these two come up as you're developing your series. I often mention addiction and incarceration as dimensions of diversity because especially in churches, we either don't talk about them or we assume that those of us in churches are not impacted. When in fact, I'm sure all of us know people who are impacted by addiction in some way. And the same with incarceration. I'm sure all of us know someone or are related to someone who has been incarcerated or in jail or in prison, either currently or in the past. And trauma, we have differing levels of trauma and we're in the middle of a pandemic. We're on Zoom right now because of COVID and because we want to care for each other. That's a dimension of diversity and then educational background. So again, we're not going to talk about all of these things in 20 minutes, but I wanted to give you some food for thought. So sometimes when we think about diversity, um, especially in churches, we assume that it's a problem to be solved. And we think, well, gosh, we've got to fix this problem of diversity. I'm going to spend two minutes talking about um, some church growth principles that don't work so that we can move on to what does work. So this is um, an incredibly awkward I title idea, the homogenous unit principle, H-U-P. This is the big in church circles for about 20 or 30 years, and um, it doesn't work. But I'll explain what it is, because when you hear it, you may think, gosh, maybe we've tried that, or that makes sense, but I know it won't work. Um, the homogenous unit principle assumes that churches will be healthy and will grow when everyone is the same. So then you build white churches, and you build black churches, or you build churches where everyone is the same income level, or you build churches and communities where everyone is the same socioeconomic level or educational level. And if you just take away all the friction and everyone is the same, then your church will grow. That doesn't work. And it doesn't work in the real world. You could have a church where um, it could be a million percent white and the church says, well, well, everyone is the same, but there's gonna be diversity underneath the surface when you dig down. We never have a community where everyone is 100% the same. And so if we're thinking about social principles of what it means to be a faithful Christian, we realize that ignoring diversity doesn't work because all we had, especially in the gospels, were people of different backgrounds, races, genders, socioeconomic status, vocations, and they all were unified by this understanding and experience in Christ and with Christians, but they didn't suddenly become the same. So our call is to embrace diversity. And of course, we all like to say that and say, well, we really like it when we have diversity present in our churches and we like to interact with people who are different from us. But then we think, well, gosh, how do we do that? But the good news is that trying to stay in identical groups doesn't actually work. So we might as well embrace diversity. I, I really need to affirm all of you at Linworth, you are on the right track. This is a big deal that you have this social justice series. I've also been on your newsletters and been watching over the last eight to 10 years as you've made transitions um, in who you are welcoming in your church and what you stand for. And it just delights me. 
Um, so in the coming year, you're going to hear from speakers and learn about different dimensions of diversity. And so your goal, this isn't just for today, you'll get the handout, but as you're going through this series and thinking about your faith, engagement, learning, and reflection on diversity will help you do these four things. It will help you practice respectful listening because we have to listen differently to someone who is different from us. It will help you grow in empathy for those who are different than you because how do we learn and how do we grow unless we are encounter people who are different from us and learn about different experiences. Going through this series will help you consider where you may be making assumptions, whether it's about someone or a group of people. And also, I really, I am hopeful, and I think this will happen, you'll have the courage to follow your curiosity. As you're working through any kind of social justice reflection related to your faith, you can follow your curiosity. If something is interesting to you, follow it, research, learn more. So we're gonna go into small groups um, in a few minutes. And we're gonna focus on race in our discussion. So I wanna take a couple of minutes to talk about race, especially race in the church. This image um, that I brought up, the United Methodist Church has always had long commitments to dismantling racism. And also we have often fallen short. This is a screenshot of, I think it was from last summer, an article about race and racism in the United Methodist Church. And we also have a reality that our faith is a faith that we had many enslaved people, like millions of enslaved people in the United States who were brought over oftentimes and Christianity was used to try to keep them enslaved. And yet God worked through Christianity so that the faith of the colonizers and the enslavers became the faith of those who were enslaved and it has grown. And I'm, it did not erase the horrors of slavery. And we still have racism in our world today, but it is remarkable that something so, how do I wanna say this? Christianity cannot be doomed by the sins of humanity. Just leave it. So we have this campaign, United Methodist Stand Against Racism, and this was really shaped within the last um, year, building upon several other projects. Race is America's original sin, and we're not very good at talking about race and racism, and especially within the church. Like as I shared, um, Director of Diversity and Inclusion. So I've been in this role for over four years now. Uh, in West Ohio, our churches are 94% white. That's not reflective of the state of Ohio. And in our clergy body, our clergy are only 9% clergy of color. So we're working within a system where we have all these aspirations about fighting racism. And the reality is that we are an overwhelmingly white organization. So when it comes to thinking about race and racism, we have to start where we are. It is tempting, especially with any kind of social justice exploration, and especially because we're gonna go go into small groups and we're gonna say, well, how do we fix this? It's like, we're not here to fix it today. We're not gonna solve racism today in a Zoom. I'm not saying it's not urgent, but our job is not to rush, but to start with reflection, especially in a predominantly white organization to reflect upon what we know about race. So in a few minutes, um, I will put these discussion questions in the chat as well. So we're going to send you into small group rooms um, and we've got you all sorted and each person, each group will have a reporter. You're not going to answer all these questions this afternoon. And you can also use these questions in other settings. So, but the four questions I'd like you to reflect upon are, when did you first become aware of race? And what does race have to do with Linworth United Methodist? The other questions are, I think I would love to have you talk about them, but you probably won't have time today. But if you do have time, what are you afraid to talk about? And what is one step you commit to taking in your social justice faith journey? So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to put these questions in the chat. And then I believe we're going to get instructions for our small group time.
at two, three more slides. Here were your questions. Um, I really appreciate you digging in. And thanks to those friends who are not at Linworth. Thank you for adapting question number two. So just two more slides. In conclusion, um, I know we love check boxes and lists of things to do. As you're going through the next year, your call right now is to follow your curiosity. People learned about Jesus because they followed their curiosity and because someone told a story. Engaging with social justice and with different dimensions of diversity, it's the same thing. Follow your curiosity. If you have a question in your mind, you're allowed to follow it. And then consider when you're trying to jump to a quick or easy solution. I didn't hear that from any of you. I know we just had a little bit of sharing, but I am hopeful because I didn't hear people saying, well, we need to figure out this program to bring in people of color. You're sitting with figuring out who you are before you figure out what to do. And then be open to where God is directing your conversation in the coming months. I will be really intrigued to see who else you invite and what kinds of other activities and workshops you engage in. Most churches are not this brave. And so I commend you for your leadership. So finally, thank you. Thanks for letting me be with you on, it's raining now. I thought it was supposed to be snowy, but on this uh, chilly Sunday afternoon, while it would be wonderful to meet in person, there's something to be said sometimes for Zoom and uh, breakout rooms so we can talk and then gather back together again. But I wanna thank you for your time and thanks to uh, your pastoral leadership and your volunteer leaders for making this happen.